The indigenous people of the west coast of the United States of America suffered 300 years of invasion. In the process, some had lost the sense of who they were and where they came from. Greg Saris, a writer and elected chief of the Miwok tribe, is dedicated to restoring his people's culture and identity. The people that have been invaded are never colonized, no matter what happens, until they've internalized the colonizer's idea about who and what they are. When we internalize another's ideas of ourselves, we begin to judge ourselves in terms of those others. And that's when we have been successfully colonized. My people have suffered the invasion and the attempted domination of several waves of foreign invaders. First, the Spanish, who built the missions and enslaved us in the missions and introduced us first to European diseases. Those diseases wiped out approximately three quarters of our population. After the Spanish came the Mexicans. They established an elaborate slave trade. They took our men and our young boys a far ways from our homeland, traded us as slaves as far south as Mexico. Some of General Vallejo's men captured the young Indian girls and brought them into the missions where the Spanish had been. And those men raped the girls and tortured them. Sometimes they hung them on the walls and stuck things up them. They bled to death. It was a kind of game they played. My great-great-great-grandmother was a Miwok woman named Supu, and she escaped the Mexican soldiers who captured her. And she walked 50 miles barefoot up to the Russian-occupied territory, Kashaya Pomo people. And because of that, she survived and was able to regenerate an entire tribe. Tonight, we welcome Greg Saris, an author who has turned his considerable talents to chronicling a neglected part of Sonoma County history and culture, and for that, we're grateful. His books include Keeping Slug Woman Alive, Grand Avenue, and most recently, the biography Mabel McKay, Weaving the Dream. Mr. Saris is professor of English at UCLA, and elected chief of the Coast Miwok tribe. Um, this is really something for me to come here, not only to be overwhelmed by a large crowd or a large audience, but uh, for me to come back to Santa Rosa uh, and have this kind of reception. Um, certainly when I was in Santa Rosa growing up here, most people thought I would end up in San Quentin or uh, Lower 4th Street. Um, <laughs> then of course when I went to school at Stanford, I began writing about the people I grew up with here and uh, the professors were always saying to me, oh, there's no such people like this. You'll never be able to publish these stories, and uh, who will ever be interested in these people? Well, I um, published Grand Avenue. Uh, Hyperion, a very big publishing house in New York, uh, bought the book. Did you grow up on Grand Avenue? Yes, I did. I first was uh, raised in a family uh, in the other part of town, in a better part of town, who adopted me as a child. and. Uh, um, they found out that they could have their own children. They adopted me thinking they couldn't have children and when they got pregnant with their own and had their own, the father was rather abusive and didn't want me and I ended up in different homes and farms and ranches and eventually with Indian people and up and around on Grand Avenue. Grand Avenue is a real mixed neighborhood. Uh, a lot of Indian people, uh, Mexican-American, African-American, Filipino-American, some Anglos. What you basically get here, if you're familiar with Indian reservations, is a reservation in town. <laughs> sort of what you might want to call an in-town reservation that happens to be integrated. The story how I got to be queen, which was one of the pivotal stories in the story Grand Avenue, was based on a family that lived in this house right here where you see the for rent sign. This is about a girl from her point of view. She's 14 years old, her sister's getting into gangs and her mother's drinking, there's a lot of trouble and she's, you know, thinking of dropping out of school. You know, in the gangs, the toughest girl's the queen, right? So uh, anyway, she says, I watched Justine across the street. I seen her from the window. Even with Sheldon and Jeffrey asking for lunch, I seen clear enough to know she was up to her old tricks. 
damn black neck squaw mom says, dirty fat Indian, you don't even know which Filipino in that apple orchard is my father, Justine says. On and on it goes. One of the issues that characters in my book struggle with is identity, because it's one of the issues I've had to deal with all my life. Since I was adopted as a baby, I had to go on a search for my own personal identity when I got older. Um, I discovered years later that my natural mother, who was Jewish and Irish, died when I was born, or shortly thereafter. And my natural father was half American Indian and half Filipino, just like one of my characters, incidentally, in Grand Avenue. But on my birth certificate, it had for my father unknown non-white, which is ultimately, I feel, what the government, what the dominant culture would like all of us to feel about our identities. They would like them, us to be unknown non-whites, as confused as I was, um, not knowing, and therefore not being able to claim any rights. If you don't know specifically who and what you are, you can't go and say, uh, my ancestors had this land, these are the stories that go along with it, and these are the ways in which you took it from me. So if you're unknown non-white, you're basically lesser, but you also don't have any rights because you're not tied to any group. So this issue of identity becomes important to us as a group of people, as people native to this land. Remember, as a race of people, you're always just one generation away from extinction. Somewhere along in the 40s, the Coast Miwok were terminated as a tribe by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Because of this, and through no fault of our own, we cease to be legally recognized as a tribe by the federal government. Now, ironically, as we petition the BIA, we're having to prove to the U.S. government that we're Indians. After they wouldn't let us be Indians and didn't give us a land base or a way to maintain our culture, now they're saying, okay, we basically, we did everything we could to stop you from being Indians. Now prove that you didn't get stopped. There's a hierarchy in the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and we have to submit our formal petition to Sacramento. Remember, the two principal parts of the document are the oral histories that Ben Ortiz is doing and the genealogy, which um, Sylvia is doing, and our own record of documenting continuous cultural activities. The process of acknowledgement, what it means is political recognition so that we have our rights, number one. Number two, it's a recognition in a way so that we can recover our hearts, our souls, and our histories. We're talking about identity, and identity is story. And you take a person's story, which is what the, uh, the Spanish missionaries, the Mexicans want to do, and ultimately the early Americans. They wanted us out of the way, because if our stories are alive and our identity is alive, we still have power. I thought I'd bring this book and you might be able to sign it for me. Well, of course I'd sign it. You know, you were the one who gave me the ability to write. I think when I came into your class, I thought I would be a dope pusher to make money. <laughs> <laughs> when I came into your class, I was an angry young man. And uh, the real test is to get over the anger and light the darkness. And I've tried to light it with my writing, with my stories. Oh, you have, you have, coach. Yeah. You? Yeah. you have. So real, real. That's nice. a, one of the things I've tried to do. Yeah. yeah. What can I say? Um, Mr. DeSoto, for getting me started, for the tough help that got me to where I am today, thank you, Greg Saris, your student in 1969. Greg, thanks again. Well, thank you. This is really something to see here. God bless. In Grand Avenue, I focus a lot about poison. Well, in the Indian community, in the Indian tradition, there was always this notion of poison, where somebody could do bad medicine. But it's another way of thinking about hate and the ugly parts of life that become a part of us. And that's the Indian way is to call it poison, okay? But the real job here and what happens in the stories is that the people overcome the hate and the poison, the darkness in our lives. The old time Indian people always told stories to remind us who we are, why we're the way we are, who we are, and what else? To teach the right way to live. Even your teachers here are teaching you the right way to live. A lot of our elders are now passing on, the elders that had that link to that old world. It's our job, perhaps in different forms, to write them and preserve them. And that's one of the things I want to do. That's how I have an identity. People always say to me, oh, you think you're some kind of medicine person or special person? I said, no, but I do know my job, and that's to write, to tell the stories. 
it's like a little seed that grows within inside of you know to go back to finding their roots it's always there and all it takes is just someone to come along with a little bit of water and just wet it and then that seed will grow it will sprout 